Hello friends. I know that it's been a while since I've recorded a video. I've had plenty of people reach out to me and say, hey, what, what's going on? <clears throat> well, I um, figured I would take some time and record my thoughts about what's going on in Israel right now, how that impacts things pertaining to Ezra Siegel, at least in my mind. And you can uh, take my thoughts for what they're worth. So before I jump into what's going on in Israel, I think that it is important that we have a little bit of a conversation about the nature of lands of promise, as well as the covenants of the Lord. The United States of America is a land of promise, perhaps better said, North America and really the Americas are special. The Lord has always considered them to be special, but particularly North America. North America will be the center point where the new Jerusalem will be established and the millennial reign of the earth will be governed from both the new Jerusalem and Jerusalem of old. Out of Two, two capital cities in two lands of promise. Now, let's look at what has happened in North America in the past. Well, you have the Jaredite nation that I believe was established in North America. And they were wiped out because Jared and his brother, the brother of Jared and their friends and families made a covenant with the Lord. And the, as a result of that covenant, this was shortly after the events of the Tower of Babel when the Lord confounded the languages of the people because of what they were doing uh, in building this incredible tower, which if you look in the Book of Jubilees was staggeringly huge. I mean, we're talking about a tower that was 8,000 feet tall and you know, several, like 8,000 feet wide at its base and 12,000 feet long. So, I mean, you're talking about <laughs> an enormous structure that would be the largest man-made structure ever built. Clearly, there's something going on there that we don't uh, really understand right now. But the Lord said, no, we're not doing this. And the Jaredites went to North America. Here, they prospered for a while until... You know, they, secret combinations grew up amongst them. They, they fought, the nation divided. You know, they had, similar to what happened with the House of Israel, they had fiery flying serpents come amongst them. They had droughts and famines. Some of the Jaredites escaped to the southern lands and then these wild beasts and these mysterious you know, flying serpents cut off the way and the people had to repent or perish. Well, they went on, they continued for a while, but ultimately the entire nation, every man, woman, and child that did not escape, escape into the Southern lands was killed. And, you know, it was only uh, Coriantumr that, that survived. That is a testament to what happens when People forsake their covenants. Look at what happened to the Nephite nation. This was North America. Again, I believe the Nephite nation was established in the Northern Hemisphere. And they created a nation that was founded upon a covenant with the Lord. And when they kept faithful to that covenant, they were blessed and prospered in the land. And when they turned their back on the Lord, then they had wars and famines and incredible destructions. And ultimately the Nephite nation was destroyed because they turned their back on the Lord and those covenants. If we read in that record, we learn that the Gentiles that will be established upon that covenant land in the last days will have the same choice to make. Will they keep the covenants that the Lord has made or will they turn their backs on the Lord? And if we turn our backs on the Lord, the covenants, the prophecies in the Book of Mormon 
clearly state that the Lord will wipe us out and another more righteous people will inherit this land, referred to as the remnant of Jacob. So this is the context of promised lands. Now let's, let's go to the land of Israel, which this, for some reason, and well, it's, it's not for some reason, it's, it's because people have begun to turn away from the Lord. They disbelieve traditional Judeo-Christian teachings and values, which demonstrate that the land of Israel has been covenanted to the Jews. And well, really to all the house of Israel. But today, we only have Judah and Joseph. Everyone else is gone. They're missing. You know, I'm talking about the main bodies of these people. And they will be restored. The lost tribes of Israel will be restored in a manner that will rival the exodus of, of Egypt. It will be the most spectacular event that the world has ever seen. That's why the 10th article of faith talks about the gathering of Israel and the restoration of the 10 tribes. So again, looking at these covenant lands for Israel, we have Palestine, which really is just Israel renamed. I mean, once, once the Jews revolted and the Romans went in there and wiped them out in an event that the book of Daniel refers to as the abomination of desolation, they, I mean, according to Josephus, over a million Jews were killed. And then 10% or 90% of the Jews were killed and 10% were taken to the Roman Empire and sold off as slaves where they were dispersed throughout all of Europe over the course of time. They were driven from state to from nation to nation. You can uh, clearly see this if you look at the history of, of Europe. During the Spanish Inquisition, they were driven from Spain, they were driven from you know, all over. Every, every place that they were, were they were pushed and um, driven over the, the whole course of their history. Well, in 1948, just you know, prior to 1948, the British went into the Holy Land and conquered it again. And, you know, this had been an ongoing uh, arm wrestle between the powers that be in the world um, wrestling over the Holy Land. And once the Romans wiped out the, the Jews for once and for all and scattered them abroad, they changed the name from Israel to Palestine because they didn't, they didn't want the connotative covenant relation, the religious, you know, meaning to the land to be remembered. They wanted to erase it. So there were still some Jews living in Palestine. There were also Arabs that came in and filled in that vacuum that resulted uh, from the Romans destroying uh, the Jewish nation. So everyone who lived there was called a Palestinian from that point onward. So you have the Crusades wrestling back and forth over the lands of Palestine. You know, that goes on for hundreds of years. And then you have in the 1800s, the British come in and conquer all of Palestine and it's part of their empire. And after the atrocities of World War II, when the Nazis tried to eradicate the Jews with Hitler's final solution, because all of you know, the problems of, the, uh, of Europe were attributed to the Jews in the minds of the Nazis and if for those of you who have read my book of Enoch, you clearly understand that there is much, much more to this than this simple summary. But the Jews were hunted down in a war of an extermination. Well, after that happened, the world came together and said, we need to create a homeland for the Jews. Of course, the United States kind of led this push and it led to the establishment of the nation of Israel in 1948. Now, England, the British Empire, 
they did not allow the Jews to arm themselves. Everybody knew that as soon as Britain withdrew from Palestine, that the Muslims would try to eradicate the Jews. And they just thought that the situation would take care of itself. They created this nation state. It's, it, it's for the Jews that the Jews can hold on to it. Well, the fact that the Jews retained those covenant lands is astounding. And it should blow the socks off of anyone who looks into the history here. Because here you have basically a handful of Jews compared to nations in the hundreds of millions surrounding them. They are an island in a hostile sea. They should have been, for all intents and purposes, wiped off the face of the map. This is where the phrase from the river to the sea comes from. Because the Jews, and you know, the spirit was moving amongst the Jews, they knew what was going to happen. And inspired men sent Jewish people out into the world after World War II had ended to the scrapyards to recover munitions equipment. And they had to dissemble this equipment and ship it over to Israel as scrap metal. Otherwise, the British would not have allowed it into the country. And then they assembled these munition factories in secret underneath the nose of the British. Now, when the British withdrew, the Arabs went in with the intention of driving the Jews into the sea. <clears throat> But that did not happen. The Lord was with the Jews. And incredibly, they expanded the borders of their nation to include the West Bank, Gaza Strip, all the way to the River Jordan. Um, and yeah, it, was, it was absolutely astounding. And after... A few days, the Arab nation said, whoa, 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 time out, we're done. And then you have Israel with a much larger chunk of its ancestral lands than it had originally been granted to it by the United Kingdom. So this is a mixture. Now you, you start having Jews from every country on the planet amassing in large numbers in Israel. You also, of course, have the Arab folks that had been living there as well. And for the most part, the average Arab person and the average Jewish person can live together harmoniously. I mean, they will treat each other with kindness and you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to see. However, there has always been within Islam this radicalized component that has created their own version of Allah. And this is no different from what Israel did in the past when they created their own version of the Lord, who was just not translated. It meant Baal the Lord. And they twisted their worship of Baal to the, to the point that they had created themselves a whole new God. Uh, it certainly was not. Jehovah was not the Lord God Almighty. It was a perversion. And the Israelites worshipped this perversion and thought that they were righteous in doing so. But they were not. And as a result of this perversion, they were swept off of their lands. The northern kingdom of Israel was eradicated in 720 BC and disappeared from history. They've since been known as the Lost Ten Tribes. Now, there's this radical component of Islam that has done exactly the same thing. They worship a God who they believe wants them to commit genocide against his covenant people. It makes no sense. Anyone who has read the Bible knows that the house of Israel is the Lord's covenant people. Anyone who has read the Quran 
knows that the Quran speaks to the house of Israel, recognizing that the house of Israel is the Lord's covenant people. It calls the house of Israel to repentance, actually. So there's this radicalized component in Israel. Hamas is a radicalized component. ISIS was a radicalized component. Um, Hezbollah to the north of Israel is a radicalized component of Islam. Iran is, uh, at least the leadership of Iran, has been highly radicalized. <clears throat> so these radical groups have, in their twisted version of Islam, have it in their mind that they can bring about the second coming of Jesus Christ, who they believe in, not as the Son of God, but as a great prophet that will come and instigate the judgment of the world. So they believe that by eradicating the Jews, they will kick off the events of the last days. So they're doing, in the name of God, these horrific acts of violence against the Jews. And there have been groups that have been doing this ever since Israel was formed. So to combat this, Israel built border walls. And before they built these border walls, there were continuous terrorist attacks. You would have Palestinians that would stab Jews in the streets. You would have them with suicide vests go into on to crowded uh, bus stations and, and blow themselves up, go into restaurants, just randomly mow people down with machine guns. And so Israel said, this cannot happen anymore. And they built this border wall. And then you had this significant difference between the people, the Jews, and those that were on the other side of the border wall who were under the jurisdiction of the uh, Palestinian Authority. So the Palestines, the Palestinian Authority is, is basically their own form of self-governance. This Palestinian Authority is supposed to be the ones that are providing all of the public services to the Palestinians, not the Jews. In this regard, they're supposed to be self-governing. Now, anyone who is intellectually honest, when they look at this situation, understands that the Palestinian Authority is absolutely corrupt. 40% of their budget goes to fund Hamas. They use their funds not to better the lives of their people, such as providing them running water and trash collection services and quality education. Those things do not exist in Palestine. Not because they can't, but because the funds are being diverted to other areas. The Palestinians understand this. I mean, there was a, a Gallup poll that was taken of the Palestinians. 80% of them say, yes, we know that the Palestinian Authority is corrupt. So it's, it's not so much the Jews that are oppressing the people of Palestine as it is these radicalized Islamic components that get tremendous mileage out of this oppression that they themselves are facilitating. Indeed, Hamas goes and, and builds bunkers underneath hospitals and residential areas and schools because they know that it, if Israel destroys them, it will also destroy hospitals and schools and residential areas, and there will be all kinds of blood and carnage that they can uh, run on the news and make Israel look like they are you know, terrible people that need to be eradicated. So we have all of this now playing out in the, the public square. And because of the scale of the events of October 7th, we have people that are going, holy cow, is this the end? And I think that it's very important for people to understand that the events of the last days are a matter of perspective. If you live in the Ukraine right now, 
you think it's the end of the world. If you live in the Gaza Strip, you think it's the end of the world. If you are one of those Jewish families who had Hamas fighters come into your family room and mow down your children in front of your eyes, it feels like the end of the world. Now, it's important for us to understand that personal feelings do not dictate reality. Are we seeing the beginning of the end? Well, we've been seeing the beginning of the end for some time now. But I do think that the events that are taking place right now in Israel will be an accelerant to the events of the last days. Now, there have been certain people that have put specific scriptures coming. You know, Daniel talks about uh, some specific timing that will occur between when the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination which maketh desolate is placed. And if you go and you look, these, these folks are saying, look, when the church closed the temples up to October 7th, when this terrorist attack occurred, was approximately 1,290 days. I think it's actually uh, 91 days. But when you look at this, and you go to some of these prophecies in Daniel, and you say, holy cow, the closing of the temples was the removal of the daily sacrifice. So the events that have happened approximately 1,290 days after this has to be the placing of the abomination of desolation prophesied in the scriptures. Now, there are have been two abominations of desolations, or there will be two, I should say. We read about this in Matthew 24. The first abomination of desolation was when the Romans went and encompassed Jerusalem and destroyed the cities of Israel. And Jerusalem was like the last holdout. And once they, they did that, it was over for the Jews. They went in and ultimately Jerusalem fell 90% of the Jews were killed and 10% were carried into captivity. And then the Jewish state ceased to exist until 1948. Now, the second abomination of desolation is not Hamas attacking some southern border cities. As horrific as that was, there is no stretch of the imagination where I can compare that the events of October 7th to what the Romans did to Jerusalem. We're looking for a future event. What is the second abomination of desolation? Well, the second abomination of desolation is referred to as the Battle of Armageddon. And you can read about the Battle of Armageddon in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. We have in those chapters a man who is described as Gog from Magog. And he comes from the north and attacks Israel from the north. The cities of Israel fall before this guy. This guy is incredible. He amasses all the nations of the earth that will fight against Israel come onto his side. And this is the Latter-day Antichrist. He's the stout horn of Daniel's visions. He is the mouth speaking great blasphemies of John the Revelator's visions. He is the Assyrian of Isaiah's prophecies. There, he is the son of perdition from Paul's prophecies in his letter to the Thessalonians. So originally, this stout horn, this antichrist, this false prophet, he rises to power in America. If you think about the vision of Ezra's eagle, how there were four 
feathers that were reserved, short feathers that were reserved unto the end, and then two that were reserved to the very end after the three heads of Ezra's eagle take over. Well, the Antichrist and someone who empowers him are these last two feathers, okay? And they're driven from America when, by the ships of Chittim. If you, you can read about this in Daniel chapter 11. But before the Antichrist rises to power, he plucks up three leaders by their roots. You can read about this in Daniel chapter 7 and 8. These three kings that are plucked up uh, from their roots, I believe, are the three heads of Esther's eagle. And the first of these kings has a horrible reproach about him. And he goes and he makes war against the Arab nations. And you can read about this in Daniel 11. So the reproach that this king has about him, I believe, is because the people of America, he rises to power by eliminating these four short feathers. And he eliminates three of them simultaneously. So the, the first of these short feathers would have had to have been Donald Trump. And Donald Trump's presidency would have had to have been cut short because of the interventions of the deep state. This is not a political discussion. This is a secret. Uh, this is a discussion about the Whore of Babylon. The Whore of Babylon is discussed in great detail in the book of Revelation. I believe Revelation chapter 17, you can read about this. Um, you can read about this in 1 Nephi chapter 14. Uh, the Whore of Babylon and the great and abominable church are one and the same. The secret combinations that Nephi saw would arise in America in the last days, and also Moroni saw the same thing. You can read about that in uh, the last couple of verses of Ether chapter 8. These secret combinations are real. They're absolutely literal. The whore of Babylon is real. And when you look at the whole premise of Ezra's eagle, the timing of these uh, 20 feathers, they all correlate around the rise of the whore of Babylon in modern times. So the whore of Babylon intervened and basically ended Trump's administration before it should have been uh, officially uh, terminated. And then you have now the presidency of Joe Biden. And he is a short feather. And there are two others. According to the specific wording of the prophecy, it says that two others will think in their hearts to be set up. And as they so think in their hearts, that the heads of the eagle wake up and devour them, all three of them, Joe Biden and two others that think in their hearts to have the rule of the kingdom. So let's look at what is going on today. Today, you were gearing up for the next election cycle. And you have Mr. Kennedy, who is saying, listen, the Democrats have rigged it. I'm going to now run as a third party candidate. And you have no doubt the front uh, runner for the Republicans will be Donald Trump. There is a vast difference between Donald Trump and the next you know, Republican candidate. There's just, there's no comparison. So you have these two figures and Kennedy and Trump are both enemies of the deep state. I mean, you look at Kennedy's family history. His uh, uncle was JFK who was assassinated. He was the first short feather in this series. You have Robert Kennedy who was also killed by the deep state because they were worried that he might become president. So now you have Mr. Kennedy and President Trump 
that are thinking in their hearts that they will become president. Well, a third party candidate is the worst thing that could possibly happen for the Democrats. Because with a third party candidate, and especially someone that is as popular as Kennedy, is going to draw away an incredible amount of votes, making it impossible for Biden to win. So I believe that as we get closer to this, the writing is on the wall that you are going to have Donald Trump as the president of the, the free world once more. And there is absolutely no way that the deep state will permit this to happen. The deep state would not permit Mr. Kennedy to be president either. So this, this is not, I'm not talking politically here. I'm talking about a prophecy that is 2,600 years old. I know that Donald Trump is a trigger for a lot of people because he happens to be rude and crude and crass and conceited and very atypical when it comes to uh, a polished <laughs> political figure. However, he also happens to be the greatest arch enemy of the deep state that the world has ever seen. And so there is no way that the deep state will allow this to happen. And so something is going to occur that will take out, I believe, Joe Biden, Trump, and Kennedy at the same time. What this is, I can't tell you. I don't know. I believe it will be a terrorist-style attack of a magnitude that we have not seen on U.S. soil. I believe that the events that are taking place in Israel right now are providing the fuel for such an attack to take place, the justification amongst the Islamic extremists for such a terrible event to take place. Now, could we stop something like this from happening? Absolutely, we could. But you look at what's going on in the southern border, and it is clear that the powers that be will not stop this. We have no idea who is coming across that southern border of ours, but you can bet your bottom dollar that we have hostile folks coming across. Now, you also look at the rhetoric that is coming out of Iran, Iran right now. I mean, they are clearly saying that because of the support that America is giving to Israel, that America will pay a heavy price in the, the blood and treasure of its citizens. To me, that is all the deep state needs to create a false flag event that would enable them to eliminate all three of these, these men and usher in a continuity of governance type scenario wherein they have power uh, over the whole kit and caboodle. Typically, the US government has been governed with a segregation of duties in a continuity of government type scenario that goes out the window. And I think that's what we're going to see. And that is the stigma that will be upon this first eagle head, which I believe is a man and not one of the either the congressional executive or judicial branches of government. I think this is a man. He dies in pain in his bed. He has a stigma and he he exercises unrighteous dominion over all the nations of the earth to such an incredible degree that it has never been seen before. Now, something happens to him and he dies. And the next person, according to, if you read 
Daniel chapter 11, or my book, Daniel 11, which I go through this in, in great detail in that book. The next person seeks to restore the glory of the kingdom. And I think that this means he seeks to end whatever conflict we have. Probably we go over in Iran and do what we did in Iraq. And I think that the next guy is going to say, okay, I'm ending this and we're going to focus on rebuilding America. The stigma disappears as a result of this from this guy because he's focusing on building back better. And he dies very shortly after returning to America. And the third says that he, Daniel 11, says that he will raise taxes or seek to raise taxes for the glory of the kingdom. In other words, he is trying to rebuild America as well. But he dies also very quickly under mysterious uh, conditions. I believe that the death of these three consecutive leaders of this country is what Daniel was referring to when he said that three of these kings will be plucked up by their roots by the stout horn, the Antichrist. And in Daniel 11, it says that they will not give him the honor of the kingdom, meaning this Antichrist, but that he will obtain it through flatteries. Now, I think that we're, when we're talking about they will not give him the honor of the kingdom, we're talking about the deep state. They will have seen three of their greatest darlings fall one after another. After a tremendous amount of planning, uh, they're gone. And now here comes a wild card and they will not trust him. And for good reason, because when you look at the scriptures, particularly I'm talking about Revelation chapter 17, this Antichrist turns on the deep state, the whore of Babylon, and destroys them in one hour. Globally, the, the whore of Babylon is taken down, all except for 10 leaders. And these 10 leaders, specifically the scriptures say, that they do not yet have a kingdom, but have power with this Antichrist for one hour, meaning a brief period of time. Together, the Antichrist and these 10 leaders eradicate the whore of Babylon. They burn it with fire, they devour its flesh, it is gone. And then they take the governance of the world. He starts with America because that is bar none the most powerful country, most powerful force on the planet. Compared to the United States of America, China is an absolute joke. They have a large economy, yes, but they have billions of people and they have tremendous trials on their own shores. China, there is no way China could take on America on its own, absolutely not. So you see China has entered into an agreement with Russia. And Russia and China have entered into agreements with North Korea, with uh, Iran, uh, with some of the despot kingdoms of the world. These, if you look at the bad boys of Ezekiel 38 and 39, those kingdoms, they're already part of this alliance that is referenced will be part of this incredible force that will go against Israel and establish the abomination which maketh desolate. So the abomination which maketh the abomination of desolation has not happened yet. And it's probably years from happening. Why? Because the events of Ezra's eagle have not occurred yet. And we haven't seen the rise of this Antichrist yet. And I know that there are all kinds of people out there that are putting out all kinds of names for what the Antichrist is. And frankly, they're all laughable. The Elon Musk is not the Antichrist. He's actually, I think, in my opinion, an awesome guy who is trying to wrestle power out of the hands of the deep state. He is not the Antichrist. George Soros is not the Antichrist. <laughs> you know, 
King George, or not King George, uh, King Charles is not the Antichrist. Have you read the scriptures that talk about what this Antichrist is going to be like? He will have godlike power. None of these men have anything like this. So we haven't seen this man. But I believe that we will see him shortly because the prophecy of Ezra's eagle has an expiration date on it. it these events must happen before January 20th of 2025 because the revelation of exactly explicitly states that Biden will be away faster than Trump was. Trump was in office for four years, so Biden cannot be in office for four years. These events have to occur before that. And you look at what is going on in America today, you have the deep state doing everything they possibly can to make Trump ineligible for running. All of these lawsuits, there have been numerous states that have tried to disqualify, make it a law that he cannot be a candidate in their state because he led an insurrection and you know the Supreme Court has struck those things down. So they're, they're doing everything that they can to try to stop him. And the history of the dis, uh, deep states battles with Donald Trump have Donald Trump is not like a normal person. And honestly, if he were not if he did not have as high of an opinion of himself as he does, he would have dropped out long ago. There is a reason that Donald Trump is who he is. And, you know, he is the biggest obstacle in the deep state's path towards their objectives. And so the events of Ezra's Eagle will take place out of frustration because they have, there is no way that they will let Donald Trump take office. Absolutely no way. So this is my thoughts on what's going on in the world today. There's a lot that still needs to happen. The things that are going on in Israel, I, I expect actually that they will calm down for a while. And then they're going to blow up again. And But what has started already and will only accelerate is the anti, you know, Semitism that we're seeing, that we ha the world has not seen since the days of the Nazis. And the reason is the same demonic inspiration for the Nazi party's ideologies is alive and well today. You see that on our college campuses. You see that with many of our political figures across the globe. And these things are going to spread like a cancer. And it's because of a twisting of the narrative. By taking Hamas's version of events that are transpiring in Israel, and then amplifying that with the 24-7 mainstream media megaphone, we are creating anti-Semites at rates that have not been seen since Adolf Hitler. I never would have thought that this would have been possible, but it is. I mean, you have stars of David being spray painted on people's homes in Europe right now. So this ground swelling movement is underway. It is going to grow and grow and grow until every person that will not take up the sword against their neighbor will have to flee to America because everyone else will be at war and they'll be at war with each other, and the 
Antichrist will channel, channel their rage and their hatred against the Jews. And then they will go to war against um, Israel. And they will, for the most part, be successful in that war. They will enter, as I said, Israel from the north. Galilee will fall. Um, Tel Aviv will fall. All of these little towns that dot the, you know, barren lands of Israel are going to fall one after another until you get to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem will be a stumbling block for the Antichrist, for, you know, Gog from Magog. And he will be held at bay there for three and a half years. The abomination of desolation will last three and a half years. According to, you know, the prophets of the Old Testament, about two thirds of the Jews will be killed. This is horrific. But you will have a remnant that will survive. And it's incredibly curious to me. There was a recent Pew Research poll on Jewish millennials. And that found that one third of Jewish millennials are Messianic Jews, meaning that they believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. That's, that's very curious to me. Now you've got this, this groundswell amongst the millennials of Israel. Because everywhere else in the world, the millennials are falling off a cliff. <laughs> when I when I think sing that sing that song, shall the youth of Zion falter? I just oh <laughs> you know we have some very strong youth, but the youth of our day, this rising generation, is being deceived by the narrative of the whore of Babylon, hook, line, and sinker. And they th they think that the morality of our fathers no longer applies to them. And we go back to the covenants that the Lord has made with his people and with promised lands. You can rage against the Lord. Supporting Israel can be, you know, against the narrative and you can rage against Israel. You can be offended by those that support Israel. Just as many of the Jews were offended at the doctrines of Christ. And they turned away and followed him no more. At the end of the day, it doesn't give a flying fig what if you're offended because of the covenants that the Lord has made with Israel. It, honestly, it doesn't. Your personal opinions and thoughts on this matter do not they will not tip the scale. The God is God. What he says goes. He says that Israel is a land of promise for all 12 tribes of Israel. And in our lifetime, we will see all the lands of Israel and much more besides given to the tribes of Israel, all 12 of them. There are many scriptures, particularly in the Book of Mormon, when Christ spoke to the Nephites, saying that Israel will inherit the desolate cities of the Gentiles. Those that rebel against the Lord, however popular that is, will be wiped out. I know that doesn't sound good to say, but every man, woman, and child, they will be left neither root nor branch. It's, it's, it's horrible to talk about. Just look at what happened to the Nephites. Look what happened to the Jaredites. Look at what happened to the Canaanites. Look at what happened to the to the uh, northern kingdom of Israel. You know, history repeats itself over and over again. So as you start seeing these things take place, you need to look at all of this from the perspective of the covenants that the Lord has made with the house of Israel, because he has not forgotten those covenants. 
Maybe you have forgotten them, but the Lord has not. And his fulfillment of those covenants will shock the world. Just go and look at, for the timing of when the Lord is about to fulfill those covenants, it's incredible. Look at 1 Nephi chapter 14, I think it's verse 17. It's the destruction of the whore of Babylon. Who destroys the whore of Babylon? The Antichrist and these 10 horns that uh, join him. They destroy the whore of Babylon. That is the sign that the father is about to restore the house of Israel. How does the father restore the house of Israel? Well, he does it through the returning of the ships of Chittim in an event that will rival the exodus of, uh, of Egypt. Friends, we have incredible things that lay ahead of us. Some of these things will be scary. Some of them will be terrifying. Uh, there are scriptures that say that men's hearts will fail them for fear and for those things which they see coming upon the earth from the heavens. You know, it's, uh, it's hard to talk about these things without sounding crazy. For those of you who have read my book of Enoch, you absolutely know what I'm talking about. There's things that I just, I would never dream about talking about publicly in a video like, like this because it's, it's too crazy for most people to believe. Even though we see things in our headlines today, every day, that should cause us to scratch our head and go, whoa, 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 what is going on? How does this fit? with my religious paradigm. But we don't do that. We just set it aside, we ignore it, and we assume that it, do, it does not exist for it cannot exist, for we have no box for it. That is stupidity at its finest. Sticking your head in the, the sand, assuming that because you don't know it, it's not true. <clears throat> this is going to be one of the reasons why these coming days are so challenging for the world. But the Lord has blessed us with incredible knowledge. The Book of Mormon is, bar none, the most incredible tool that we have to prepare for the events of the last days. If you want to prepare, study the Isaiah chapters. They were put there for a reason. The Lord commanded us to study the words of Isaiah. Then he gave us the specific chapters that we should start with. Christ's discourse to the Nephites. Incredible. Incredible. The, the entire Book of Mormon. What, why do you have so much of the Book of Mormon that is dedicated to war chapters? Well, it's talking about how saints can retain their faith in times of war. We are all going to experience that. We're going to need to learn how to put our allegiance not with a party, but with our covenants to the Lord. That's what Captain Moroni was doing when he went from city to city with his standard of liberty, rallying the people to remember the covenants they had made with the Lord. Because if you are with the Lord, you will be prospered in the land. If you are not with the Lord, you will be swept off. And Nephi promised us that the righteous have no need to fear of the events that are coming because they will be preserved even if it so be as by fire. I know that that is true. I know that Israel will be restored in the coming days in a manner that most people are not looking for. And that is why King's mouths will be agape because they will be flabbergasted by things that they had never considered. Because even if a man proclaimed it to them, they would not believe it. And so it is. Well, friends, I've gone on for an hour. Um, I hope that this has been beneficial for you. I'll, uh, I have been asked you know, numerous times now to put out something, uh, come follow me on the book of Revelation that's coming up. If you have any specific questions with regards to the book of Revelation, put them in the comments to this video and I will try to answer them in a video that I'll put out you know, within the next you know, week or two. Um, until then, friends, hold tight to the Lord. He is who he says he is. It's all true. Just turn the whore of Babylon off. The, the narrative may resonate with this generation, but it, 
It's not true. All right, friends. God bless.